Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you, we praise you, we bless you, we honor you, we glorify you. We give you thanks and praise and honor and thanksgiving. We just lay our lives before you, O Lord, knowing that you are a wonderful God, an awesome God, a God of love, a God of mercy, whose love and mercy never end. Your word says, Lord, that your love, your mercy, your compassion is new every morning. And tonight, this today, Lord, as we come before you, we just lay our lives before you, Lord. We just surrender everything to you, knowing, Lord, that you and you alone have the best plans for us, plans for our welfare, not for our disaster. Today, Lord, just as you stayed focused, just as you had that goal, especially going to the cross of Calvary, so that through that cross, you would deliver, you would save the whole human race. Help each one of us in this life to also stay focused on that goal, on that mission, on that purpose that you have put each one of us. Today, once again, Spirit of God, as you teach us the word, help us, Lord, to have an understanding of the word. Make this simple te this teaching simple, easy to understand. Give us practical knowledge of the word so that we can apply it in our day-to-day -day life. Lord, as I share the word, nothing of me, everything of you. And let this word, Lord, that we are hearing, we put into, our, into practice every single day of our life so that at the end, Lord, we can finish the purpose we can finish that mission which you have put each one of us on this earth. Staying focused the way you stayed focused right to the cross of Calvary. We thank you and we praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, today we are going to reflect on the day's gospel from John chapter 13, verses 21 to 33 and then we have a break from 34 and 35 and then from 36 to 38 which is the last verse of this of this chapter and you know my sisters and brothers today's gospel is about Jesus revealing to his disciples of the betrayal of one of his own disciples you know my brothers and sisters today's gospel in fact, if we ever read that gospel and we ask the Holy Spirit for revelation, if we were in the place of Jesus, we would have actually quit. We would have said, all this time I spent with these men, I gave them love, I gave them everything. And yet, one of them is going to betray me in the hands of the chief priest, is going to betray me to the soldiers. One disciple whom I, whom I had so much of trust about, and that was Peter, He's going to declare three times he doesn't know me. And all these things Jesus already knew in his spirit. And in spite of that, he chooses to have his last meal with these 12 disciples, knowing that they will not stay faithful to him till the end. And they is the one he chooses to have that meal together with them. And you know, my sisters and brothers, today as we reflect on the gospel, just like those 12 disciples who, who at that very moment did not show it to, the, to, the, to, the, to their master that they were not sincere about, in, about his ministry. But Jesus, in spite of knowing that they would, they would, one of them would betray him, one of them would deny him three times, yet this Lord of ours trusted them. He, they, he trusted his father knowing that these same men who would turn away from him would come back on the day of Pentecost and make such an impact in the kingdom of God. And you know, my sisters and brothers, if you and I can relate ourselves to these 12 disciples before Pentecost, like people who, who, who go to church, who hear the word of God, do everything. But the day we receive Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. On that particular day, we who were unfaithful, we who were cowards, we who were so timid suddenly became so strong, suddenly became so brave, suddenly became so courageous in order to share the gospel with our very own lifestyles. 
And that's exactly what we are going to see in today's gospel. So let's go uh, turn our Bibles over to John chapter 13, verse number 21. John chapter 13, verse number 21. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, Very truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. Jesus is troubled in his spirit and he opens his mouth and he declares, he says, Very truly, I tell you, very truly. You know, I, I, I'm not going to make any mistake here. I know what I'm saying. And every time I open my mouth, that word that I'm going to tell you is the truth and truth alone. He says, very truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. One of you will betray me. You know, my sisters and brothers, what a totally different way Jesus had of exposing this terrible act of Judas. You know, this way of Jesus exposing Judas is, is, is betrayal is totally different from what you and I would ever do if we knew somebody was going to betray us. You know, you know, brothers and sisters, most men, most men, men or women, whatever, would have been angry and lashed out at the person they knew would betray them. Literally, they would have found some way to get even to that person if they knew they had betrayed them. And you know, many others would, would have asked the other followers or the other disciples to beat Judas and possibly even kill him for planning betrayal of their master. But what does Jesus do? What does Jesus do? You know, my brothers and sisters, Jesus simply made this plan of Judas without mentioning his name, made it known to all the disciples so that his disciples would know that he was the Christ. You know, my sister and brother, if Jesus knew that he who was his betrayer, Jesus knew that Peter was going to be, uh, deny him three times. Jesus knew that Judas was going to hand him over to the chief priests and the scribes and the Romans. Would you think if he was not a God of love, he was not a God of mercy, he was not a God of compassion, who did not bother about how others treated him, but how he would treat them anyway, then he would never have been the God you and I are serving today. You know, my sisters and brothers, God is a God of love. The word of God says, God is love. You know, if, if, if you ever put any line in the Bible where it talks about God kind of love, God is exactly that. God is love. And you know, in, in Jesus, there was no malice in him, even towards the one who betrayed him. What a merciful God we serve, brothers and sisters. What a compassionate God we serve. What an awesome God we have. And his name is Jesus. You know, today as we, as we reflect on this gospel, as we near to the, you know, to the tridium of the Holy Week, that is, that is Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then finally the Easter celebration. Today's gospel is actually allowing all of us who are reflecting on the day's gospel to appreciate, to understand what a loving God we serve. What an awesome God we serve. What a merciful God we serve. He doesn't look at the way we have behaved. He doesn't look at our past to give us a new future. You know, sisters and brothers, when you and I understand that the prodigal son could come back after blowing up all his money, he blew up everything that his, his, his father had given him. And yet, because he knew that his father was a different type of person, he knew his father was a God who would for, was a father who would forgive him. The prodigal son, after blowing up everything, he had, he had squandered away everything. He came back to his father, and his father not only welcomed him, but he restored him to full sonship, putting a ring on his finger, you know, having a big feast and celebrating his son's return. And the same way, my brothers and sisters, you and I today, if we have had a bad past, we have had an, a past which has been so sinful where we have never ever done anything right. We have been unfaithful. We have done all sorts of sin. The good news we have today is this God is a God of mercy. This God is a God of comfort. This God is a God of compassion. This God is a God of unconditional love. If you and I can come to him, repent of all that we have done, he just erases our past 
and gives us such a future that no one of you and I can ever imagine what that future will be. Not only on this earth, but we will also experience eternal life for all eternity with Jesus when he returns. Let us go to verse number 22. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. You know, when Jesus made this statement, one of you is going to betray me, naturally, my brothers and sisters, all the disciples were actually uncertain. They did not know who was the one who was going to betray them because even though Judas, the, the traitor, was with them, they would never have imagined that they had the traitor among the 12 of them. And you know, sisters and brothers, this particular gospel is also mentioned, this particular incident about the, about the betrayal and Jesus' last supper is mentioned in Matthew's gospel, it is mentioned in Luke's gospel, and it is also mentioned in Mark's gospel. If you go to Matthew's account, especially if you go to Matthew chapter uh, 22, uh, 26 verse 22. Can we read that please? Matthew chapter 26 verse number 22. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. Surely not I, Lord. You know, sisters and brothers, none of those disciples ever could believe that they could be the ones who are betraying their master. Look at what Luke says. Luke, Luke's gospel says, they began to discuss among themselves first who would be the one who would betray them. Luke chapter 22, verse number 23. Then they began to ask one another, which one of them it could be who would do this? Which one of them would be who would do this? You know, they were, they were totally shocked. They had been together with Jesus for three and a half years. They had seen the great miracles that their master was performing. They had a bonding among themselves and they just couldn't understand who would be the one who would betray their master. Let's go and see what Mark's gospel says. Mark chapter 14, verse number 19. They, uh, Mark's gospel say, shows us that each one of them began to ask the Lord if they were the one. They wanted to know whether they were the one who was going to betray because they were confused. Mark chapter 14, verse number 19. They began to be distressed and to say to him one after another, Surely not I. Surely not I. You know, sisters and brothers, the disciples of Jesus at that time when the, when the master said, One of you is going to betray me, they were confused because none of them could ever have imagined doing such a thing to their own master. And although the traitor was very much with them, you don't understand what would have been going into Judas' mind. You know, my brothers and sisters, if somebody is a traitor and is keeping quiet in a group, it could be in a, in a parish, it could be in a church, it could be even in your own family. Can you imagine what must have been going through Judas' mind? You know, he knew he was caught. He was caught red-handed because his master knew who was the one who was going to betray him. And yet, this Judas... When all the other disciples are asking, is it I, Lord? He has maintained his very creepy silence. Can you imagine, my brothers and sisters? Judas knew that he was the one who was going to betray his master. Now that Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me, he did not have the audacity. He did not have the guts to even say, Lord, I'm going to be the one who's going to betray you. You know, brothers and sisters, Jesus only asked, the, you know, not Jesus, I mean, Judas only asked the Lord if he was the one after all the disciples had asked the question. You know, it, it appears to us that, you know, he felt that if he, he could admit his guilt, you know, nobody would ask. You know, if he, if he had asked the question, Lord, is it I? You know, if, when, a, when a person is going to betray his master and he yet asks his master who knows that he's going to be the betrayer, he's asking his master, Lord, is it I? Can you imagine? And yet, my brothers and sisters, this same man, Judas, would have experienced a lot of fear in his heart when he asked, surely not I, Rabbi. What did Jesus reply to him? What did Jesus say to him when the same coward, the same traitor asked his master, 
Surely not I, Rabbi. Let us see what Jesus says to him. One of his disciples, you have said so. You have said so. That is what Jesus told uh, Judas when he asked the question, surely not I, Rabbi. You know, my friends, says, what could he have felt like, you know, my brother says, if Jesus had singled him out before all the disciples, if Jesus had to say, Judas, you are the one who is going to betray me. You are the one who has made a plan with the Pharisees. You are the one who is going to, you know, co collaborate with the Herodians and with all the people and you are going to betray me. You know, my sisters and brothers, it's very unlikely. Listen to this. If Jesus had to actually mention to his disciples that night, that it was Judas who was going to betray him, it is very unlikely Judas would have left that room alive. Because Peter and all the other disciples would have totally torn him to pieces. They would have cut him to pieces. We already saw later, we will see that on Good Friday through the reading, that when the, when the slave of, Mal his name was Malchus, and you know, when they all came to pick up Jesus at the garden of, you know, at, at, you know, at Kidron Valley, at that very moment, Peter pulled out his sword and he cut off the slave, the, uh, the, the ear of the slave because he was a very hot tempered man. And had he known that Judas was the one who was going to betray his master, it's very unlikely that Jesus, that Judas would ever leave that room alive. And you know, my sisters and brothers, listen to this very carefully. Jesus knows that Judas is going to betray him. Judas knows that Jesus knows about that he's going to betray him. In spite of this, this man still comes with, along with the 12 disciples. Can you imagine if Judas knew that Jesus loved him so much? Judas knew that Jesus would have already known that he's the traitor, yet he knew what a loving God he was, that he would still give him an opportunity to, you know, to, to, to repent and to change his mind. And you know, sisters and brothers, it was not the, the, that he, that Judas, uh, you know, became the traitor that sent him to hell. Surely Jesus would have forgiven him. Even if Judas had to, you know, betray Jesus and he had to come back after betraying Jesus, surely Jesus would have accepted Judas because Jesus had to go anyway to the cross. He had to die. Peter betrayed, I mean, denied Jesus three times, but he came back. But Judas, in spite of betraying him, did not come back because that guilt ate him up and he went and committed suicide. So sisters and brothers, Judas, in spite of betraying Jesus, was not, it was not that was the reason by which he went to hell or that was the reason he, he was condemned for all eternity. Judas rejected the love of Jesus. He knew the love of Jesus. He knew that he was the traitor, yet he came and had a meal with Jesus. Yet he came because he knew Jesus would never expose him. And yet, after being a traitor, even after experiencing all the love from Jesus, Jesus washing his feet, forgiving him all his sins, Judas went outside and actually rejected the love of Jesus. You know, my sisters and brothers, our individual sins will never take us to hell because Jesus has already paid for our individual sins. If you have committed adultery, you have committed murder, you have committed theft, you have committed all sorts of sins, they have already been paid for on the cross of Calvary. But the only sin that is going to take us to hell is this rejecting the love of Jesus, rejecting his love, rejecting him as our savior, because without having Jesus our savior, we can never make it to to heaven in all eternity. And that's why my brothers and sisters, this sin of Judas should actually open our eyes that God never looks at our past to give us a bright new future. Judas, even after being a traitor, still had the opportunity to repent like Peter and come back to Jesus and say, Lord, Anyway, I, I've, I've betrayed you, but I have come back. Jesus would have still accepted him. Jesus had washed him in his, washed his feet in advance and forgiven him of that sin. But it was Judas, not because he was a traitor that he, 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 he condemned himself, but because he rejected the love of Jesus. And now he allowed himself not to experience God's love. And that's why my brothers and sisters, the only sin that is going to take us to hell that's what uh, Jesus says. Every sin can be forgiven, 
But the sin against the Holy Spirit can never be forgiven. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the one who pours the love of God in our hearts. It is the Holy Spirit that, you know, according to Roman chapter 5 verse 5, it says, the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. When we reject the love of God, we are rejecting that the Holy Spirit, we are, we are sinning against the Holy Spirit. And that's the time we are condemning ourselves, not God who sent his son to pay for all our sins. Let us read John chapter 13 verses 23 to 25. Let's take these three verses. 23 to 25. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? You know, this particular verse is specifically referring to John, the apostle whom Jesus loved. You know, my sisters and brothers, I'm not going to go and give you reference. I'm going to go into detail about John. But this gospel has been written by John and it's talking about G John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And it reveals, you know, my own sisters, a lot about this apostle John. You know, John always referred to himself to the disciple whom Jesus loved. And you know, I'm sure Jesus loved all his disciples because Jesus does not have any partiality. He has no favorites. But Jesus received that revelation in a very special way that he was the one whom Jesus loved in a very special way. You know, sisters and brothers, if you go to the book of Revelations, the last chapter which, which, uh, which has been written in the Bible, the book of Revelations is what John saw the glory of the, of, the, of the resurrected Christ in the book of Revelations. I want to show you in Revelation chapter 1 verse number 7. Let us read that. He, verse number 17, sorry. Revelation chapter 1 verse number 17. It talks about John falling at the feet of Jesus. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. So, sisters and brothers, what was the difference between this Jesus, whom John had actually sat and, you know, uh, had a food with, and the same Jesus who revealed himself to John at Patmos after he resurrected? You know, the physical body of Jesus was like a veil that Jesus used to cover his true self. You know, the glory of God was already inside of Jesus, but he just had an external body. And you know, the, the disciples on the top of the mountain on the day of the transfiguration had seen this external body of Jesus just being taken away and they were able to see that inner part of Jesus, the glory of Jesus. And so when Jesus appeared on the island of Patmos to John, Jesus appeared in all his glory to John on that island. And you know, my brothers and sisters, please understand this. In the spiritual realm, Jesus was the same in both the cases, whether he walked on this earth as the son of man or whether he was in the spiritual realm with his father. He was the same Jesus. But the sinless physical body of Jesus, you know, was covering his true, uh, you know, his true divinity, which was already on the inside of him. And that is why, you know, my brothers and sisters, it is actually better for you and me today that we know Jesus, not through his physical body, but we know him better through his word. Because the word gives us the revelation of who Jesus really is. And the Holy Spirit will actually give us a true image in our hearts of what Jesus is to each one of us. You know, my brothers and sisters, during the time of Jesus, you know, if you go back to the to the time of the Middle Eastern and they still have it the same practice today. I've seen it in my own eyes. You know, in the in the Middle East, the custom is they don't sit on tables and chairs. If you really go to conventional Middle Eastern families, they never sit on table and chairs. They sit, you know, around the table on couches. They sit on pillows. They actually sit reclining on the table. And, you know, this is the reason why John, the disciples, was leaning on the chest of Jesus. He was leaning on the chest of Jesus because Jesus was the one who loved him. And you know, 
if you really go and see how the arrangement was, many of you have got the picture of the Last Supper at your house. But that picture is not the right picture. That was not the arrangement at the Last Supper. You know, my sisters and brothers, if you really want to know what the scholars and what the people who are according to tradition tell us, Jesus was in the center. He had John on his right. He had Judas on his left. And then he had the five disciples in front. They were sitting in a U shaped. And that is why Peter, uh, John, was able to recline on the chest of Jesus and whisper to him. And that was the time Jesus was able to whisper that, jo that Judas was the traitor only to John. That's why John was the only disciple on the table who knew that Judas was the traitor. You know, my sisters and brothers, please understand. Jesus was protecting Judas from the other disciples. Yet he could trust John not to open his mouth and tell everybody that Judas was the traitor because Jesus trusted John. John was the disciple whom Jesus loved. And although with Jesus on that table, John was the only disciple apart from Judas himself was the traitor. None of the other disciples ever knew that the traitor was sitting with them and his name was Judas. You know, my sisters and brothers, you hear in this particular verse that Peter did not ask this question. Peter did not ask this question. It appears that John was more intimate with, with Jesus and would therefore stand a better chance of getting that answer replied. You know, Peter could have asked Jesus directly, Lord, who is going to betray you? But what did he do? He motioned to John because John would have definitely got the answer. And even though he got the answer, John did not open his mouth. John did not tell anybody because he knew if he had opened his mouth, Judas was not going to leave that place all by itself alive. You know, sisters and brothers, those who are intimate with Jesus have a rapport with him that others don't have. And that's why the moment your relationship with Jesus, the moment your relationship with the word is strong, you know, you can stand out. The wisdom of God is going to flow with you. People are going to come and ask for your opinion because they value the wisdom that you have in Christ because of your intimacy with the Lord, because of your intimacy with the word of God. Please understand, people are not going to come to you. Yes, people will come to you because of the chair. There are so many people today who got holding high positions in office. They are holding positions of director, of chairman. But you know what? They are only respecting the chair, not the person. That person loses that chair, nobody ever looks at them. But when you are truly grounded and rooted in the word of God, you may not hold a position in this world. You may not have the job of a, a position of a chairman. But what you have, you have an intimacy with the Lord of heaven and earth. You have a rapport with the Lord of heaven and earth. And others who don't have it, you automatically begin to enjoy the favor because you are in touch with the CEO of heaven and earth. You are in touch with the, with, the, with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. When you know the word of God, you know what the word says. You have a relationship. You are experiencing eternal life. Nobody can ever challenge you because the wisdom that comes, comes directly from the throne of God. John chapter 13 verses 26 and 27. Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, do quickly what you are going to do. You know, sisters and brothers, in these verses 26 and 27, there is a lot that we can learn. A lot of things we can learn in this in these verses. First and foremost, all the four gospel writers reveal to us that Judas was the one who would betray Jesus. It is mentioned in Matthew chapter 26. It is mentioned in uh, Mark chapter 14. We just saw that. It is mentioned in Luke chapter 24, uh, 22. And it is also mentioned in John's gospel, John chapter 13. But you know, my sisters and brothers, there is, a, there is a difference between all, this, all the synoptic gospel writers. 
only Matthew and Mark record that Jesus was saying that it would be that it would uh, you know that he would be the one who would dip his bread in the dish with Jesus that, that Judas would dip his bread in the dish with Jesus while John records that it would be the he the one who would dip his his, 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 his dish and hand it over to Judas there's a difference Mark and Matthew are telling that Judas would would put his uh, you know he would dip his dish in Jesus's dish and take the sauce Whereas John is saying that Jesus would take it and dip it and give it to John. You know, sisters and brothers, whatever be the case, whether it was Jesus dipping it and giving to Judas, or whether it was Judas dipping it and taking it from Jesus' table, either way, Judas was the one who was going to get that bread. And you know, my sisters and brothers, during the old time, betrayal was revealed by a gesture of friendship. You know, betrayal was, was revealed by a gesture of friendship. What is the meaning? Jesus, in fact, when, 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 when Judas came and kissed Jesus, you will see that on Good Friday to the readings. He came to Jesus and he kissed him to reveal to the soldiers that Jesus was the one whom they should have arrested. And so, betrayal was revealed by a gesture of, friend, of friendship, but it was a fake gesture of friendship. You know, Jesus wasn't hurt because, you know, he wasn't felt, uh, selfish. Jesus wasn't selfish. You know, Jesus knew that this man was going to betray him. So, Jesus didn't get hurt because he was, you know, because Judas was doing all this thing. And therefore, Jude, Jesus did not hurt the one who was going to hurt him. Can you imagine, my brothers and sisters, what a quality of Jesus, what a quality of our God. Many times today, when things don't go right in our life, we open our mouth and we say, God is punishing me. You know, my sisters and brothers, this word that God is punishing me is a term which is a very religious term, which is absolutely wrong, absolutely false, because God is punishing no one. He punished his son, Jesus, for you and me on the cross. If you are facing any negative situation in your life, it is not coming from the Lord. It is coming from the evil one. And you know, sisters and brothers, even though Jesus was hurt or Jesus could have been hurt because of Judas' betrayal, Jesus did not seek to hurt Judas. You know, this particular attitude of Jesus not being, you know, giving tit for tat or giving eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. He had been teaching that. If someone slaps you on one cheek, show the other cheek as well. And here, throughout the trial and the crucifixion, which culminated in Jesus going to the cross, what did Jesus say on the cross? You know, my brothers and sisters, you, you hear Jesus talking in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Can we read that, please? You know, Jesus is hanging there on the cross. He's bruised. He's broken. He has bled so much. He has been abused. There is no mercy shown to him. But look at this God, in spite of enduring all that suffering, he see what Jesus says to his father in Luke chapter 23, verse number 24. Then Jesus said, Father, <clears throat> forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. You know, sisters and brothers, many a times we read this verse, Verse 23, verse, uh, I mean, chapter 23, verse 34 from Luke's gospel. And we say, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Do you think that those people did not know what they were doing? Do you for a second ever think that those people were, were blind, that they were abusing Jesus? But you know, my sisters and brothers, the reason why Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing is only because those people who were doing all those things were inspired by the devil. They were inspired by Satan. Satan was in control of this earth. He was using all his agents. He was using all his resources. But when Jesus went to the cross and he died, which was illegal for the devil to do with his agents, Satan lost the battle against Jesus. Jesus was able to snatch that authority from Satan and give it back to, the, to, to, to man because he was illegally killed on the cross. That's why Jesus did not want himself to be disqualified in spite of the pain, in spite of the suffering. And he forgave every single person. What can we learn, my brothers and sisters? Listen to this very carefully. Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, verse 25, 
He said, we always talk about that when we talk about the law of faith. If you have any hurt against anybody, if anybody you need to forgive because they have hurt you, go first, reconcile with them, forgive them. Because if you do not forgive them, God cannot forgive you. You know, my sisters and brothers, Jesus could have opened one word and his father would have destroyed. He would have turned all those people into a, into a pile of ashes. But look at the love of Jesus. He forgives them. He gives them an opportunity to be saved in spite of the fact that they did all that to him. In the same way, you and I today, if we have been hurt by people, either by words, by deeds, by things which have happened before, we have all never gone to the cross. Nobody has hung on the cross. Nobody has suffered the way Jesus suffered. But if we understand what Jesus did for us on the cross, how he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We can take this scripture and use it in order to get the grace of God to forgive somebody who has hurt us, who has humiliated us, who has bashed us up, who has done so much of harm in our life. And if we do that, we had just opened ourselves to the mercy and love and forgiveness of God and no blessing of God can ever stop in our life when we forgive those who have hurt us. Let's go further, my brothers and sisters. Again, this verse tells us that Satan, I mean Judas, you know, when he received the bread, Satan entered into him. That's what it says. It just tells us the moment Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. You know, my brothers, and sisters, this only shows us that Satan himself was present at Jesus' last supper with his disciples. Many of you will be shocked. Jesus is right now having his meal for the last time with his disciples before he goes to the cross of Calvary. Satan is also present in that room. Many of you will be shocked. But the truth is, Satan was present also at the Last Supper. And brothers and sisters, if Jesus could not, if Jesus, I mean, I won't say could not, he couldn't or wouldn't keep Satan out of the communion service, then we can keep Satan out of our church services also. Satan is very much present in our church services. Please understand that. If you understand that Jesus couldn't keep Satan out at the Last Supper, just moments before he was going to go to the cross of Calvary. Why are you and I should be surprised if Satan is not present at our communion services? You know, my brothers and sisters, if we, ever, if we somehow plead the blood of Jesus in such a way that no demons could be present at our gatherings or, you know, we could rebuke them, then no, no one, no people would ever be there at, at our communion services. Nobody would be there. Nobody, not a single person would be there at every communion service. This is, some, this is a revelation that you should understand, which will, which will shock many of us. You know, when we go to the church and we gather together, let's ask ourselves this question. Are we multitasking when we come to the church? Are we, when we come to Bible study, are we just, you know, just listening? Or are we really hearing, making notes, really attentive to the word? Or are we multitasking? Chicken in the oven, some phone call in between, somebody's, uh, you know, some work to do. It will never help me because, you know, Satan is going to bring distractions in my life and he's going to steal the word away. Please understand, my brothers and sisters, when the word is preached, the word of God tells us if you read in the, in the sower and the seed, the seed that fell on the pathway indicates those who never understood the word of God. Satan comes immediately and takes the word away so that those people will not understand and they will never bear fruit in the kingdom. You know, my sisters and brothers, Satan is not afraid of people going to church. Satan is not afraid of people who are praying. Satan is not afraid of people whether you sit 24 hours in front of the blessed sacrament. Satan is afraid of the person who has hit the word in their heart, who knows the word and he knows his authority in Christ because that word which is hidden in your heart is going to be a threat, is going to be a disaster to, the, to his kingdom. And therefore, it is very important for us to have understanding of the word, to hide the word in our heart, to speak it out and to do it every single day. That's the time we are going to get Satan packing off from our presence. And you know, my brothers and sisters, according to John chapter 13, verse number 2, the devil had already put into Judas' heart the desire to, 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 to betray Jesus. You know, I, let me read that please. John chapter 13 verse number 2. The devil had already put it into the heart 
of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. So the devil had already put that desire in the heart of Simon Peter, uh, uh, I mean Judas Iscariot. You know my brothers and sisters, here Satan himself entered into Judas to accomplish this terrible act of betrayal. It was Satan who entered into him. But you must understand that the desire came before he actually decided to do that betrayal. Remember my brothers and sisters, Satan can't just overpower people and take control. Many times we give Satan too much of credit, but we must understand Satan gains control through thoughts that lead to desires. And when desires are conceived, people give him the control of their lives. And that's the sign Satan goes and makes a mess of our life. Please understand this. I want to show you what James chapter 1 verses 14 to 15, I believe. James chapter 1 verses 14 to 15 tell us about all these things. First comes the thoughts. Those thoughts lead to desires. Those desires are now conceived. And when desires are conceived, it brings to full sin. That's the time Satan gets full control. Let's read James chapter 1 verses 14 to 15. But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Then, when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to to sin and that sin when it is fully grown gives birth to death okay what is saint james saying and what exactly we saw about this last supper thing by brothers and sisters let me give you a simple example if somebody wants to commit adultery or somebody wants to rob a bank he won't directly go to a woman and he'll directly have a relationship with her or he will not directly go to the bank and he'll rob the bank First and foremost, he has to conceive that thought in his mind. So the moment I begin to start thinking about it, now those thoughts are going to give me desires and that desire is going to finally go and make me do that sin and finally that sin, when it is committed, is going to put me into big trouble. That's the time Satan takes full control of my life. You know, sisters and brothers, what happened to David? What happened to David? David was a man after God's own heart. But what happened? David, when he should have been going to battle with, his, with, with all his soldiers, he decided to stay back in the palace and he must have been having a good afternoon siesta one day where all his soldiers had gone to battle. He goes up to the roof and while he's doing nothing absolutely, he spots Beersheba, the wife of Uriah. She was been taking a shower. Immediately when he starts seeing her, the desire comes in. He wants this woman who's the wife of somebody else. He gets her to the palace, he commits adultery with her and eventually he finds that Bathsheba is pregnant with his baby. And finally, after that, he calls the husband and we all know the story, he gets the husband killed because he doesn't want the husband to, you know, because first of all, the husband is not going to sleep with his wife and nobody is going to know. But the prophet Nathan comes and exposes David because David wanted to cover up that sin of adultery. He wanted to cover up that sin of, uh, of, uh, of murder, but God sent the prophet Nathan and exposed that sin. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, nothing, no sin that we ever do in our life will just happen just by itself. We need to first think it first. We need to start desiring it first. And when that desire becomes full grown, that's the time we will commit all those sins. And you know, my brothers and sisters, you will notice that Jesus told uh, uh, Judas to do what he was going to do quickly. What did Jesus tell him? Go quickly and do what you're going to do. Jesus was speaking about Judas' betrayal. And you know what did the disciples think? The disciples thought something else. They thought that Jesus was telling them to go, you know, and get money to the poor or buy something for the festival. You know, my brothers and sisters, Jesus knew by this time that his time to go to the cross was inevitable. He knew his time had come and he wanted it to get over it. You know, he just wanted to get it done. He did not want to linger and finger. That's why we should never procrastinate when the Lord is directing us for anything. You know, many a times the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, 
but we are just procrastinating we are just delaying one after the other we are keeping our repentance for another day maybe we are keeping our repentance till we we, we retire now we tell the lord lord i'm young right now let me enjoy life i'm working i'm enjoy i'm really need to enjoy my life that time will come when i will be away from all my work i will retire and then i will i will serve you you know my sister and brothers we may never even have that time to repent we may never even have a time where we'll retire look at what is happening during the pandemic the pandemic has not seen young and old people who are even 20 years old in fact just today we i just got a news about half an hour back a uh, somebody who was just 40 years old married only 2 2 two, uh, two months ago he died of covid 19 just 2 months ago he was married So brothers and sisters we can't wait and postpone things we can't procrastinate we can't delay the situation Jesus knew that his time had come he just wanted to get it done in the same way each one of us will go through difficult situations in our life once we know we can't avoid those things we need to just get them over as quickly as possible we should not get it procrastinating because the more we procrastinate the more we are going to give the devil a chance to give us all the evil desires and take us away from god mark john chapter 13 verses 28 to 30 let us read these three verses together now no one at the table knew why he had said this to him some thought that because judas had the common purse jesus was telling him <clears throat> buy what we need for the festival or that he should give something to the poor so after receiving the piece of bread he immediately went out and it was night you know sisters and brothers when i when i when i was reading this verse i was just reflecting for a moment these 11 disciples still didn't understand that judas would betray jesus they just did not understand they they couldn't even believe that one of among them would ever betray their master and you know my brothers this is absolutely Im- Im- amazing and it says a lot about these disciples why you know if they have been together with jesus for 2 3 and 1/2 years these men were very intimate they had a real fellowship they had a good bonding with each other and they had lived together for over this 3 and 1/2 years they had shared meals together and doubtless many joys many tears many successes many failures they must have even laughed together they must have had a great fellowship for this 3 and 1/2 years with jesus yet they didn't perceive the treachery in judas's heart they just couldn't bring themselves to think that one of them would ever go and betray jesus sisters and brothers let us ask ourselves this question We have been following the Lord Jesus. We have been baptized in a Christian family. Many of us are born in a Catholic home. We have been baptized at our child. We have been going to church. We have been praying. We have been doing all the things. Now this Holy Week, we'll be going to Monday Thursday. We'll be going to Good Friday. We'll be going to Easter service. We have been going to Christmas. We have been going to all the uh, Sunday masses. We have been doing everything perfectly. Are we still people just like this uh, disciples? who in spite of you know knowing this intimacy we have had with Jesus are we still betraying him what is the meaning of betray him you know my sisters and brothers please understand this betrayal doesn't mean that i'm going to betray jesus by telling you know everybody i don't know jesus you may not have that opportunity maybe some of us may have one day that you know we'll be brought before kings and governors for our faith but what is the meaning of betraying jesus you know jesus has given us his word You know God holds his word as precious as his name but people today have made the word of God so insignificant in their life they don't obey the word of God and as a result they have betrayed Jesus so when they go out into the world they say that they are Christian they say they are Christ at least they put a cross on their on their on their body they have got all these uh, scapulars and they have got even bible verses on their t-shirt but you know my sisters and brothers the way we conduct ourselves the way we behave you know among a pagan world and among people who are non christian is simply betraying this god who actually has possessed us on the inside if we are truly born again if we have truly accepted jesus we need to watch ourselves 
how we conduct ourselves before pagans and before even believers because when believers meet together they should be exuding that joy they should be exuding that love they should ex be exuding that peace that only Jesus gives us on the inside and which can come on the outside when we renew our mind and you know my brothers and sisters Although Jesus had very, you know, very plainly or very clearly revealed Judas was the one who would betray him, his disciples didn't understand that Jesus was telling Judas to just go about what he had planned to do. They did not understand that Jesus was instructing Judas to do that very, the very thing that he was revealing to him, that he was going to be the traitor. And they thought that Jesus just wanted him to go, you know, and make some provisions for the feast or give some money to the poor. And this verse reveals that Judas was the treasurer of Jesus. He was the treasurer who was holding the money back. You know, my sisters and brothers, can you imagine a person who has love for money and a person who's got the money back is supposed to be an absolutely disastrous combination. As it is, he's a thief. We saw that yesterday when, when Mary wanted to put that perfume on Jesus. He wanted to desire that perfume and sell that perfume so that he could get the money. And you know, sisters and brothers, the disciples didn't think that it was strange that Jesus uh, would send Judas to go and give money to the poor even at that night. Because it is recorded that, you know, they used to give money to the poor. They used to have certain things like this. But again, I believe, you know, my sister and brother, this is something that, again, I'm just sharing with you. You know, we can only speculate what Judas was thinking and feeling. You know, when Jesus tells him, go ahead and do what you're supposed to do, he's not telling him to go and give money to the poor. He's not telling him, you know, go and buy some food for the festival. Go and make some prayer. He's telling him, go ahead and do what you want to do. Go and betray me. The disciples think otherwise. I suppose, my brothers and sisters, Judas must have felt embarrassed. And then after he was embarrassed, as he went out, he was angry. He was full of venom inside because he was exposed by Jesus. And I believe... He finalized his betrayal in anger as a way to get back at Jesus for what he perceived as humiliation caused by Jesus to him. But Jesus did not cause any humiliation to Judas. My sister and brothers, Jesus simply wanted to expose Judas and tell him, listen, I know you are the betrayer. I want you to know that I am not just an ordinary person. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. You have believed me for three and a half years and I know exactly what you are planning. But Judas, in spite of knowing that Jesus revealed to him that he was the traitor, that he was the one who was going to betray him, instead of repenting, understanding that Jesus was no ordinary man to reveal this to him, he simply went out, got back at Jesus, betrayed Jesus and destroyed his own life. So it was the betrayal that was not his sin. It was his rejecting the love of Jesus, as I explained earlier, that sent Judas to hell. John chapter 13, verses 31 and 32. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Now, listen to this very carefully, my brothers and sisters. Judas had just left the upper room and was going out now in the process of betraying his master. He had left the room. Jesus had told him, go out, go quickly, do whatever you have to do. Jesus, what he told Judas and what Judas knew he was going to do was very clear. He was out to betray him. But you know, my sister and brothers, most people would be offended and think about the insult and injury afflicted by a friend. Most people. I know this man, I've lived with him, I've shown him my glory, I've given him the best in all these three and a half years. Now this man is going to go out and betray me. You know, my brothers and sisters, but what does Jesus do? Do you think that Jesus is offended? Do you think that Jesus is insulted? Do you think that Jesus is going to dwell on what Judas is going to do? Not at all. But Judas was only praising God and speaking forth that it was this hour for which he was going to be glorified. You know, sister and brothers, please understand this. When we understand our purpose, when we understand the reason why we are on this planet Earth, then we will only glorify God 
even in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our difficulties, even when we are betrayed by a loved one. Please understand, this is not about other people. This is not about your spouse. This is not about your children. This is not about your parents. This is about you and I and our God, Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when we understand what our purpose is, when we understand why we are on this earth, then we will only praise God and we will give him glory even in the midst of our trial, even when we are going through our own Good Friday. But when we go through our Good Friday praising and trusting God, there is also going to be an Easter Sunday. You know, my brothers and sisters, this wasn't because he was aware of what was going on. No, 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 no. He was, he was fully aware of what was going on. You know, John chapter 13 verse number one emphasizes that Jesus knew all things that were going to happen to him. Jesus knew it. And rather, this is because Jesus knew all things. All things he knew. He was not only, you know, Please understand my sister and brother, Jesus was in the world and he knew the terrible things that were going to happen to him in a, in a few hours. He was going to be scourged, he was going to be beaten up, he was going to be given the cross, he was going to be hung there on the cross. And Jesus knew all the spiritual things that were going on behind the scenes. Although he knew what was going to happen physically to him in the spiritual realm, he could see in the spiritual realm exactly what his father had called him to do. And you know my sister and brothers, Listen to this very carefully. Those of us who only see with our physical eyes will always tend to be judgmental and critical of others. Listen to this again. If we are only looking with our physical eyes, when people do nasty things to us, we will immediately be judgmental. We may immediately be critical. We may immediately you know, start you know, judging the other person. It's only when we look at things that are unseen according to the word of God that we are able to be optimistic in all things. Why? Because we need to see everything through our relationship with Jesus through the word of God. You know, sometimes when you look at things as you see physically with your eyes, you look at your spouse, you look at your children, you look at your parents, you look at your boss, everything looks absolutely crazy. And when you begin to start looking even at yourself, maybe the pain in your body, whatever you're going through, you begin to begin to think it's the real thing. That's not the real thing. That's only temporary. Everything that we see with our physical eyes is temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. I want to show you what St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 16 to 18. I want you to read that please. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 16 to 18. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal what we see with our physical eyes is temporary but what we see through the word of god is permanent you know my sister and brothers if we can look at everything from an eternal perspective maybe some of us are going through some health problems some of us are going through a relational problem some of us are going through a marriage problem some of us are going through a financial problem when you begin to look at everything in light of eternity you know my sister and brothers Whatever we are going through right now, you can tell that problem, you are temporary. Because when you reach heaven, there is going to be no marriage problem. There is not going to be a financial problem. There is not going to be a health problem. So all that we are experiencing on this earth, if we understand physically, it is temporary. When we look it through the eyes of faith, to the word of God, we can always glorify God and we can see the miracle. We can see all that Jesus has already finished for us on the cross. And you know, sisters and brothers, just as Jesus glorified God, he glorified his father through faith and obedience. It caused the, you know, caused his heavenly father to glorify Jesus even more. You know, as soon as Jesus was seeing all these things happening, he could see Judas betraying. He could see Peter going to deny him. He could see his disciples just running away. They were leaving the shepherd and running away. Yet, Jesus was only glorifying his father. And the more Jesus glorified his heavenly father, the father glorified Jesus more and more. And the same, my brothers and sisters, is true even for us. 
the more we glorify God through our faith and obedience to God's word, the more the Father in heaven will glorify himself through us. That's a good news for us today. You know, sisters and brothers, maybe you're going through a difficult situation right now. I don't know what your situation is. Maybe it's a financial situation. Maybe it's a marriage situation. Maybe it's a pressure at your workplace. I don't know whether it's commitment. I don't know what your situation is. I can tell you the good news today is the more we begin to glorify God through his word, the more we begin to praise him in the midst of our difficulties, the more we begin to shout hallelujah and praise him for what he has given us. You know, maybe we are totally, you know, you know, messed up in all that thing we are going through right now. But the moment we begin to praise him, we want to glorify him, you know, in comparison to what we are doing and glorifying God, our problem begins to shrink to such a small size that our God becomes so big. But the moment we begin to glorify our problem, we have actually glorified our problem and made God so small that the devil is going to come and magnify it and mess our complete life. Today, the Lord is giving us a secret. He's telling us, in the midst of your negative situation, just glorify God. Don't glorify God for your problem, but in the midst of your situation, glorify God and tell him what a great God he is, that he has given you the strength, he's given you the patience, he's given you the endurance, he's given you the faith, he's given you the ability to look at everything as only temporary because the reward is going to be eternal. Verse number 33. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. You know, sisters and brothers, Jesus was plainly speaking about his death. You know, as soon as Jesus died, as soon as he would die, he would rise again, and they would follow him at, at, that, at that particular time. That's why he was saying, right now you cannot follow me. Because I'm going to go to a place where y'all can never come. Jesus was going to be the first fruits of all those who have fallen asleep. As soon as Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, he died. He went to that place, preached to all the souls, rose again, came back to his disciples. But the disciples' time had still not come. But they also would one day be glorified when they would be martyred for their savior. You know, my brothers and sisters, Jesus was speaking to his disciples of his death less than 24 hours when he was going to be crucified on the cross of Calvary. And you know, Jesus had actually all throughout his ministry repeatedly told his disciples of his death and his victory in resurrection so that their hearts would not be troubled, they would not be discouraged, they would not be anxious. But you know, my sisters and brothers, even though he told them in John chapter 14, verse number one, I believe. Can we read that please? I want to show you how Jesus so many times told them, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be worried. Don't be anxious. Read John chapter 14, verse number 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You know, my sisters and brothers, Jesus would not have said these words, do not let your hearts be troubled, if our hearts could ever be troubled. You know, please understand, if Jesus is saying, don't let your hearts be troubled, then there is a good reason for us not to let our hearts be troubled. And when your hearts are troubled, everything goes messy in our life. You know, sisters and brothers, if the disciples didn't understand and suffered needless agonies during those Jesus' three days, you know, in the grave, it's not because, you know, Jesus had not warned them. Jesus had already told them, but the disciples didn't understand this. They could have avoided so much of pain. They could have avoided so much of, you know, misery upon, them, upon themselves when Jesus died on the cross. But if they understood that their master was going to die and come back and rise again, they would have just been excited, waiting for their master's return. But unfortunately, they let their hearts be troubled. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, the Lord has given each one of us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of his word. Everything that is required for life and godliness. Where is it written? 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. Let us read that. His divine power has given us everything needed for life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory 
and goodness. So, brothers and sisters, if we have the promise of God, if Saint Peter has written, God has given us, you know, everything that is pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of God, then you and I just don't have any excuse for any anxiety that we are going through so many times in our life. You know, my brothers and sisters, so many Christians today are, you know, going, experiencing anxiety. They are experiencing worry. They are experiencing tension. They are experiencing, you know, turmoil in their life. Why? Because they are not aware. They don't have knowledge of the word. And you know, my brothers and sisters, we just need to believe God's word. That's all we need to do. We need to pray that God will open our mind, will open our understanding so that we can understand the scriptures. That's what Jesus prayed for those disciples on the way to Amos. He said, God, please give open their minds so that they will understand. Luke chapter 24, verse number 45. He left, Jesus was praying that, you know, they would open their minds so that he would, they would understand the scriptures. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. You know, sisters and brothers, once our minds are opened up, once we begin to understand the truth of God's word, once we begin to see everything through the word of God, that's the time we are going to receive understanding. And let, let me give you a very practical example. You know, if you, if you take a filter or take a, 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 a filter uh, or a glass which is green in color and you look at it through the green glass, all that you're going to see, even if it is black or whatever color, you will see everything green. If you take a red one, everything you're going to see red. In the same way, when we look at life and look at every situation through the lens of God's word, everything is going to be different. We are going to keep anxiety away. We are going to keep worry away. We are going to keep tensions away. But most of the time, we take out this filter of the word of God and we begin to see everything with our physical eyes and we bring tension on ourselves. We bring worry on ourselves. Today, the Lord is revealing to us another secret. He's telling us the moment we begin to see our situation, our circumstances through the eyes of the word of God, through faith, that situation will not look as big as we have made it. Even though in the natural, it looks like a total mess. When we begin to see it through the eyes of the word of God, we will begin to realize, my brothers and sisters, that that particular situation is only temporary. And you know, Jesus didn't say that everyone who, who would know us or know we are his uh, disciples by our, by our going to church or, you know, by the rituals we do or by our name or even by we attending church services. No, 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 no. People would not know. He said very clearly that the one characteristic that would cause the world to, you know, identify us as, it is, as his followers and his disciples is by our love for one another. You know, sisters and brothers, please understand this. When we have love for one another, we are proving to the world, we are proving to the Lord and we are proving to ourselves that we are true followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though we have got enemies around, you know, we receive insults from our loved one. We receive so much of negativity around because of our situation. Yet, when we make that decision to operate in agape love, we choose to make that decision not to look at what we are seeing on the other side, but operate with agape love through the eyes of faith. That situation is only going to be temporary. Our victory is very much around the corner. Our Good Friday will end and Easter will be at the corner for us. John chapter 13, verse number 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Now, Jesus, you know, my brothers and sisters had spent almost three and a half years disciplining uh, uh, Peter and all the other disciples. And yet, Peter didn't even know where Jesus was going. Can you imagine? For three and a half years, Jesus had spent time with Peter. He had been, spent time with all the other disciples, discipling them, teaching them, showing them everything, giving them all the secrets of the kingdom. And you know, my brothers and sisters, Peter wasn't alone in all this. Even though Peter is asking the question, Lord, where are you going? He was not the only one. But you know, my brothers and sisters, the information was present to them. The information was present. Everything that Jesus told to them was already there. But it seemed he lacked the ability to connect all the dots and put all the teachings of Jesus uh, given to him together in a practical way 
that would affect his understanding. You know, sisters and brothers, what is the use of coming to a Bible class? What is the use of having so much of material, all the information in our head or in our, in our books, if that understanding hasn't come? You know, it's going to be a waste just because you came to Bible class, just because you got your notebook written with a lot of notes, but you're not putting that word into practice. It's not going to help you in any way. And you know, all of this changed the day Peter was baptized in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. You know, Peter became such a mighty man of faith and power with a supernatural understanding that Peter now began to go out and he was bold enough to preach the whole gospel. He was bold enough to preach the good news to others. You know, what a testament as to a life changing power of the Holy Spirit. That's what happens when we receive the new birth, when we are born again, when we receive the new birth in Christ, my brothers and sisters, we also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And now the Holy Spirit in us begins to give us the revelation, begins to give us the secrets. And those secrets and revelations help us in order to understand how the Lord is directing our life, taking us to finish our, our mission, finish our assignment here on earth. And Jesus was actually headed back to this father. For Jesus, you know, my brothers and sisters, that journey would have been only through his death from his, and his resurrection, and then he would be ascended back to his father. And Peter, one day, would follow his master right up to death, and that's exactly what happened. We don't hear anywhere in the Bible that Peter was crucified, but we know, we have heard through, through tradition that Peter also was crucified like his master. That's exactly what this verse is saying. You know, my sisters and brothers, even though Peter asked his master, Lord, where are you going? I do not know where you're going. And yet Jesus said to him, you don't know now, Peter, but a time will come. You will know everything. And that's the time you will follow me. Let us take our final two verses for today. John chapter 13 verses 37 and 38. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. <coughs> you know, sisters and brothers, we, we, we shift focus from Judas now to Peter. <coughs> because Peter was the one who always, always spoke, you know, extra. He was the one who always said, Lord, I'll lay down my life for you. I will die with you. I'm ready to do anything for you. I'm ready to go and do anything. He was always the exuberant guy. And you know, my sisters and brothers, Jesus had made this statement uh, to the, to the, to even to the Pharisees and scribes before, because he said, you know, very truly, I tell you, he says, will you No." Peter said to the Lord, he says, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus said, answered, will you lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. You know, sisters and brothers, this statement of Jesus, he had also made this not only to his disciples, he had even made it to the, to the Pharisees and the scribes somewhere in John, John's gospel, John chapter 7, verse number 34. Let us read that. I want to show you that this was not only a statement made only to Peter and to the disciples. Jesus had also spoken these words to the Pharisees and the scribes. You will search for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. Where I am, you cannot come. You know, sisters and brothers, Jesus was very crystal clear of his mission here on earth. He knew where he had come from. He knew where he was going. He knew what his assignment is. And you know, sisters and brothers, Peter would have had time to think about all that Jesus had been talking about in his ministry. Jesus had told these things to his, uh, to the Pharisees, to the scribes. And he, I believe, my brothers and sisters, that Peter suspected Jesus was speaking about his death. You know, so that he could make a bold proclamation that he would be willing to follow Jesus right up to death on the cross. You know, sisters and brothers, it shows us that Peter had great love for Jesus. Peter loved Jesus tremendously. There is no, there's no doubt about how much Peter loved Jesus, but it also showed from this answer that he lacked an understanding of his own weakness. You know, sisters and brothers, we sometimes say we love the Lord. We are coming to Bible class. We want to go to church. We want to do something in the kingdom. 
But many a times we don't even understand our own weaknesses. We don't understand our own self. We don't understand what we can do, what we cannot do. And that is why we need to spend time with the word. We need to have a revelation from the Holy Spirit because the Lord is only going to give us an assignment which he has chosen us to do, which you and I cannot do with our own physical strength, with our own human wisdom, but the wisdom that comes from the Holy Spirit. And you know, sisters and brothers, Peter, till the Holy Spirit came, till Pentecost, was a man who was doing things on his own strength. He wanted to go and die for Jesus. He wanted to go and do the proclamation of the gospel. Jesus had to tell him, hold on boys, don't go till the Holy Spirit comes. And that is why, even though Peter loved Jesus, even though he wanted to do so many things for the kingdom, it shows us from his answer that he lacked the understanding of his own weakness. He, he did not even understand his own self. And you know, sisters and brothers, Jesus' prophecy about Peter's denial didn't cause the denials. Many times people think that because Jesus told Peter that you will deny me three times, that's why Peter denied it. No, 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 no. That's not the reason. They simply revealed what Jesus knew Peter was going to do. Jesus was God. Jesus was God in the flesh. He knew that Peter was going to be, be, uh, you know, uh, betray him. And there are some amazing insights into the faith of Jesus in this particular chapter, which I'm just going to take very quickly. You know, sisters and brothers, Jesus prophesied the denial of Peter and the betrayal of Judas. He told the disciples very clearly at the Last Supper. He says, one of you is going to betray me. He told Peter, you are the one who's going to deny me three times. And you know, my brothers and sisters, these were men who loved Jesus a lot. And he had invested so much of time. He had invested so much of effort. He had, he had discipline, uh, you know, uh, discipled them for almost three and a half years. Jesus had spent a lot of time in fellowship with his 12 disciples. There is no doubt that Jesus really took the pains to disciple his disciples. You know, my brothers and sisters. But at this greatest hour of need, what do the disciples do? They need to support their master. They need to comfort their master. They need to be with their master. But what they do, they forsake their master. And you know, my brothers and sisters, as it turned out, all the disciples just left Jesus and they fled. We read that in Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 14, verse number 50. You know, when, when, when somebody is depending on you, for example, if a husband and wife, you're, you're, you're doing a project together and all of a sudden the husband says, you know, I'm busy at work. I can't do anything for you. What's going to happen to the wife? She wants to do it for the family. What happens when the husband says, depending on the wife to do a project and she says, I'm busy with the cooking. I can't do anything for you. What happens in the church, in, the, in, in, our, in, our, in our councils in the church, when each member has been told to do something, all of a sudden somebody comes and says, listen, I cannot come. I'm busy with my family. I got a wedding coming. I got, you know, I got my job. I got my my closing of the year, I got my accounts to finish and we just desert the group. But Jesus, my brothers and sisters, at this very moment of his life, he was coming to the pinnacle of his ministry. He was going to the cross of Calvary. He was very much human. He was crying. He had tears. He had, he, he had all the emotions that you and I go. And he was expecting his disciples to come and turn around and support him. But it turned out that his disciples just fled and went away. Mark chapter 14, verse number 50. All of them deserted him and fled. All of them deserted him and fled. You know, my sister and brothers, Jesus was left alone to suffer. Can you imagine this Lord who gave them his everything? He gave his whole life for them. He taught them. He sacrificed for them. He showed them love. They just left him and they all deserted him. You know, my brothers and sisters, this sort of behavior would have crushed any ordinary man. It would have just broken any ordinary man. And even if Jesus was able to put his, you know, his personal hurts and rejections aside, how much this would have affected his thinking about the future of the church. You know, he was depending on these 12 disciples to, you know, lead the church after he went back to the father. And here, these guys are acting like jerks. They are just fors forsaken him. They have denied him. One of them has betrayed him. And now Jesus says, I'm going to the, to the cross Everything is going to be over. All these guys are going to go away. The whole purpose of my ministry is absolutely a big zero. And know my brothers and sisters, if you ever think that somebody in Jesus' position would have been broken, then you and I would also understand that Jesus was also thinking about the same thing. The men whom he considered the foundation of the church, 
you know, were all cowards. They were all going to desert him and go away. It was just a matter of days, my brothers, until Jesus would even actually, uh, you know, go back to his father. He would ascend to the, to the heavens to be with his father and turn this whole kingdom over to this man whom he had discipled for three and a half years. And if the rejection does not destroy us, my brothers and sisters, the thought of such incompetence of those who we put our hope surely would, would do that to us. You know, think about, think about parents for their children. Many a times we, we depend on our children will do well. We sacrifice for them. We give them good education. We want them to really do well in their studies. We want them to become some professionals. And then finally, after spending so much of money, so much of time, we find our children really not doing anything really worthwhile. What will happen to the parents? How dejected they will be. So many parents today have actually been heartbroken because they have invested so much of time in their children and never seen that. And you know, my brothers and sisters, the moment we begin to see in the natural, things are not going our way, it can actually crush us. But look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. You know, Jesus' faith in his father was so strong that he broke into praise of his father in spite of seeing all these things happening around him. Jesus was not going to look at his disciples who were going to betray him. Jesus was not going to look at Peter who was going to deny him three times. Jesus was not going to look at his other disciples who were just going to run away like cowards. Jesus had still faith in his father. Jesus still had faith in his disciples. He was not going to leave them alone. You know, brothers and sisters, his words to his disciples immediately after this, you know, immediately after this, it's given in John chapter 14. We are going to see that probably, uh, I don't know whether one of these days. But in John chapter 14, verse number 6, it reveals the way Jesus had such faith and he instructs us to how to operate in that same faith as he operated. He's showing us the formula. I want to show you what Jesus said. You know, I'm not going to read that. Because if you read right from John chapter 14 to John chapter 16, these three chapters, John 14, 15 and 16, you will realize that Jesus actually had a lot of faith in his father. Every prayer that Jesus uttered, every word that Jesus said only proved that Jesus really had trust in his father. If the father had sent him on earth to complete a mission to save the whole human race, Jesus knew that his father was faithful. Jesus knew that even though these disciples were going to let him down, they were going to be cowards and run away. Jesus was not going to lose heart. Imagine just before he's going to go to the cross, he's going to die. That's the end of his life on earth. Yet these disciples have all left him. They have deserted him. They have, they have betrayed him. They have, they have denied him. How much would have been going on in Jesus' mind? Brothers and sisters, when we look at the cross of Calvary, it doesn't reveal to us all that Jesus was going through in his heart, in his mind. He was broken and yet because of his trust in his father, because he believed in his disciples that one day when the, when the Holy Spirit would come, these same disciples would go to the ends of the earth and proclaim the good news. Today, my sister and brothers, if you and I can understand that God has a mission for each one of us. If you understand that there is a purpose for us, if you understand that we are not here on this earth just to occupy space, we are not here just to do our own thing and go about day after day, month after month, year after year, just go about doing our own thing. But we understand God has a specific purpose for us. There is a mission just like Jesus had a mission then surely we will take the word of God. We will be directed by the Holy Spirit to the finishing line. And like Paul, we shall also be able to say, I have run the race. I have fought the good fight of faith. Now I'm waiting for that crown, which will be given to me by the master, by my Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you for giving us the understanding of your word. Lord Jesus, when you walked on this earth, you were so focused. You were so alert to your father. You were so alert to everything that was happening around you. And yet, Lord, nothing could ever discourage you. Nothing could take your focus away. No betrayal, no denial. No cowardly disciples could ever stop you from fulfilling that mission for which you came onto this earth. Despite of that agony and that, and that disappointment of seeing the men whom you had discipled for three and a half years, leaving you at the time when you really needed them most. 
Today, Lord, each one of us are going through so many problems in our life. Maybe we are going through our marriage problem. Maybe we are going through a financial problem. Maybe we are going through a health problem. Maybe we are going through children's problems. There may be each one of us going through some sort of a problem in our life. But Lord, if you could look at your father, if you could see that these same men who betrayed you, who, who denied you, who ran away like cowards, could come back and still go to the ends of the earth and preach the gospel and finish the, the, the mission that they were entrusted to. Then today, Lord, even in the midst of the, our negative situations and circumstances, we know and we know when we stand and believe your word, we shall reach that finishing line and we will be able to complete that mission and fulfill the purpose for which you have put us on this earth. And for this great understanding, for this revelation that you are with us, in us, and that you will see us through right to the finishing line. We praise you and thank you, Father, in the glorious and mighty name of Jesus. Amen.